Hi, I am excited to be giving you a reading today. Um, I've been looking over your chart the past week or two and taking a bunch of notes. So I'm gonna be sharing those notes with you as well. You can read along with the notes as you go, if you'd like. You know, um, yeah, it's, um, I would say also because you're so left variable, don't worry too much about capturing everything I say. Left variable people like yourself are really designed to pattern match, to pattern match what's going to be interesting to you and to ignore what's not going to be interesting to you, right? So I'm going to cover a lot of material. And the thing is, you can always come back to this later, come back to the video later, you know, take different notes. At any given point in time, as a left variable person, you're pretty much tracking one set of areas of research. So for instance, in human design, you could be learning all about profile, in which case you could be learning every last thing about profile. And that's where you'd be tracking, focusing on profile, or maybe you're focusing on the centers, or maybe you're focusing on some other area of the chart. But just realize because you are left variable, you know, you can't focus on everything. It'll be overwhelming. So just pick the parts that are interesting to you and kind of focus on those. And you can always come back later um, to revisit or to find other parts as well. Okay, so to get ready, I'm gonna start sharing your chart now. So give me a second here, here we are. Excellent, this should look familiar. Pull up my notes. So I'll be sharing these notes with you too and feel free to read along or, or take your own notes. My first note is just the question. Do you sleep alone? Do you sleep alone? This is an important one. Um, you know, some people are not able to sleep alone for various reasons. And, you know, I would just say to really get into the human design experiment, you should be sleeping alone. You really should. And so if you're in an apartment building, you know, and you have a shared wall with a different unit, try moving your bed across the room to a different wall that's not shared. Try and move it to the center of the apartment. Hopefully um, the ceilings are high enough on the apartments below and above, you know, or if you're lucky to not live in an apartment, great. Um, just be cognizant of this, be conscious of sleeping alone and how that might, you know, um, interfere with the experiment. Okay, so then I, I talk a little bit about left and right variable, just in the notes, you can see. Um, and I put a little note here just to kind of set the stage. So part of setting the stage was that, you know, your innocence, you're an innocence person, that's what this means up here. And being innocence, the transference is desire, which is having an agenda or having a goal. And so even in this reading, don't worry too much about your agenda or your goal. You can always ask me questions later. You can always ask if there's certain things you're interested in and stuff like that. But don't, don't sweat it too much because, you know, um, you're innocence. You're here to kind of see what happens. I have a friend um, who's innocence and it's been really interesting. He's been in the experiment about five years now. And he's taking it seriously. I mean, he's experimenting with it. And he's really trying, um, but also because he's innocent, trying is kind of desire, right? It's kind of striving. So he's also kind of like, take it or leave it. Like, who cares kind of attitude. Well, anyway, a job came up and he was really excited about the job and then getting really nervous about the job opportunity. And he said, Jonah, how am I supposed to apply to this job when I'm innocent? You know, it seems like it's desire. I want to apply to the job. So what do I do? And I said, look, you know, you can still apply to the job. It's not about, it's about being attached to the outcome or not. Innocence people do not have to be attached to the outcome. He can apply for the job, go through all of the interviews and the whole time just stay in the middle of, it's okay if I get the job, it's okay if I don't get the job. That's both okay, right? That's what innocence is. So innocence is, you know, it's not about taking sides. We'll go into this more when we actually get to the four transformations. Let me talk more about it. So just as a general overview for what we'll be doing uh, in this reading today, we're going to go over chart characteristics first. So that'll be your channel. We're going to talk about just, you know, being a projector. We're going to talk about um, just general chart things, you know, kind of overview, 
Uh, and, and then we're going to move on after that to the four transformations. And that's when we're going to really talk about your dietary regimen, your environment, um, and then the personality side, the perspective and the motivation, which is going to be more about how you can affect other people as a projector, how you can guide them, how, how you can give them something. What you give them as an innocent person is very different from what I give them as a desire person. You know, you can give them innocent observations, which means accurate observations. You can give them objective observations. You can give them deep insights that only you see that someone like me would miss because I'm so stuck in my desire. I am so stuck looking at the goal and trying to make sure that the good happens and not the bad. Whereas for you with innocence, good news, bad news, who knows, right? So it's going to be interesting when we get to that. So we're going to do the four transformations. And then finally, we're going to, we're going to end on the not self. And we're going to just go through the centers and, and how the not self is going to play out. So the whole thing will probably take anywhere from one and a half to two hours. Um, it takes me longer because I pause during it usually to go take breaks and to think things over and such. Um, although sometimes I get in a good flow and it just kind of, the hours roll by. So we'll see. But, but you know, I just want to frame it also that you don't worry about feeling overwhelmed by all the information we're going to go into. As a left variable person, um, you know, it's funny. I mean, left variable can almost get the same information just from reading it. I don't even necessarily know that there's a huge benefit for left variable to listening to the audio um, or, or watching video. But, you know, it's because the left variable is really here to track their areas of interest. So when you're learning human design, having this leftness here, it's gonna make you track certain things. So I don't know what the first thing you started tracking was. Maybe the first thing you started tracking was type. And you went, wow, I'm a projector. These other people are generators, you know, and you start to track that and you pattern match that and you start to notice, okay, who's a projector, who's a generator. Maybe then you start to notice Penta and you notice, wow, projectors are really meant for one-on-one. -on -one. Anytime I'm in a group, there's a different dynamic here. You start to track Penta dynamics, you know, or maybe you're tracking variable. You start to notice, wow, I'm very left variable. I'm so different from these other people who are very right variable, which by the way, you do have a right variable here. And we will be talking about that um, in terms of your sixth tone uh, cognition when we get to the part about the four transformations. So we'll go more into that. But you're predominantly left, just like me. I'm PLLDLR, you're PLLDRL. So we're very left people. And I can just tell you as left people, um, you know, we're always kind of, we have our, our area of research. We have the thing we're learning about. And so what's interesting is, you know, I've gotten readings from people and as a very left person, it's different than when a right person gets a reading and they don't really know what to absorb or what to focus on. They just have to absorb everything. You know, someone who's right variable is here to just take it all in, take it all in and not discriminate and to not divide and so on. But we aren't like that. As left variable people, we are designed to pick and choose and to be like, this is boring, this is boring, this is boring, this is boring. Oh, this is interesting. And the one thing that's interesting or relevant, you know, the whole concept of relevance is a left variable concept. What's relevant to us? What's relevant to my areas of interest? What that basically means is what pattern matches to something that I'm currently already tracking. See, we're here to track things. We're here to pay attention, you know, to specific markers or things to track patterns you know you can start paying attention to your um, gate 20 in the throat which is always saying you know i am now doing this i'm now leaving i'm now going here i'm now going there and you can pay attention to these you know these different voices um or the the voice of i remember in the throat or the the voice of i know or the voice of i try or i experiment so you know um yeah, you can track these different things with your left variable. That's what you're really here to do is to kind of see what's interesting to track for you. So if you're doing your strategy and authority tracking, you know, the words that you say, then, then you know, you're going to want to pay a lot of attention, particularly to gate 20, because this is the one that connects to your gate 10. This is kind of your authority channel. 
but if you're not tracking that now, maybe you've already tracked that for a while. Maybe you've kind of put that to rest. Maybe you're tracking something else. Maybe you're tracking the undefined ego and how that undefined ego flares up sometimes when it gets triggered. You know, when someone tells you, I, I don't trust you and you don't have the stamina, that undefined ego can get its feelings hurt, can flare up. Maybe you're tracking that. So I'm just going to give you, you know, all the kinds of things that I track, right? Because I'm a very left person. So someone comes to me with their chart. I'm not taking it in holistically. It's interesting. I had a client last week say, Jonah, wh what I really want from you is to holistically give me your impression of the whole chart. What would you do to just summarize this entire chart in one word? Well, that's impossible and it's ridiculous. And I refuse to do it because there's no such thing. I mean, the more you try to summarize, the more you reduce the detail and make it more generic. But see, then I started thinking about it and I realized, well, if I was a right variable person, that would be exactly what I'm supposed to do, right? If I were a right variable person, instead of dissecting and taking it apart and looking at all the different pieces, piece by piece and in their, in their isolation, I would just kind of take it all in. You know, and, and I just don't do that. I'm a left variable person. We're here to dissect. We're here to take things apart. Um, the other thing I'll point out is that even though you and I are both left, we're very different left because you have first tone here. And the first tone here, along with the second tone, is really about staying always on. So your mind is always on. Now, here's the thing. I need to charge extra when I do readings for people with first tone like you, only when they're in person. This is great because I'm doing the reading and the privacy of my own home. You know, if I get tired, I can lay back, I can relax. You know, I have my whole um, comfortable zone here. But I'll tell you, the moment we go on a video chat, which, by the way, I'm totally happy to do. If you want to do a video chat, I, I always try to include one free follow up after the recorded video. That could be a phone call. That could be you know, a series of emails. That could be a video chat, however that works out. But I'm just going to say I kind of joke that I should charge extra for the first tone people, because here's the thing. I'm third tone. So what third tone means let me just let me just back up for a minute. The first and second tones are the core of left variables. So first of all, leftness means that your tone here is going to be one, two, or three. And rightness means it's going to be four, five, or six. Like we have a right variable over here because we have a sixth tone. So anything that's tone, that the triangle is tone. So anything that's four, five, or six is going to be right variable. Anything that's one, two, or three is going to be left variable. So these are all left. Well, you have one, one, two. So these are always on, they're always active. The first and second tones are part of what we call the splenic binary. Um, and basically what that means is it's the, the oldest, the oldest, most ancient part of our circuitry. So you have this mind that even though you have a very futuristic innocence, sixth color, underneath that innocence is this first tone, which goes back to the very beginning of humans, which is based in security, and insecurity, and it's vigilant. It is always vigilant. And so my joke about why I should charge more with first tones is because they work me out. It's like, I'm designed to sprint. I'm designed to mostly be lazy, mostly be tired, and then periodically my mind sprints because I have an action mind. If you were to look at my chart, you would see I have a third tone. The, and the, the third and the fourth tone are um, part of the Ajna binary. And that's really at the, the cross section between left variable and right variable. Uh, you'll notice in, um, here I'm going to sh show over, this will be helpful actually. You'll notice in the notes that I put a little characteristics of leftness and rightness. That's just a way that can help, help right there. Uh, so you can see that in the notes. So, you know, that, that's just kind of as a reminder. Well, what's, what's interesting is when you have this first tone, your mind is just always vigilant, always active, always going. You know, it's, it's a marathon, not a sprint. It's funny because my mind can look more active, you know, especially on my YouTube videos or when I'm really amped up or when I really get excited about something. If I see something that makes me mad and I start going, how is that possible? How could you do this? You know, and I start to get really animated. Then it looks like my mind is just firing a million miles a minute. And it is, it is for like an hour max. And then I hit the wall. So this is what's interesting is, my mind has to be on kind of a slow roll a lot of the time. And when I amp it up and ratchet it up, 
into and leap into action, you know, it kind of jumps into action, but then it gets exhausted really quick. Your mind's not like that. Your mind doesn't get exhausted. This is what was funny about when I was traveling with Mike, my business partner, you know, he has first tone here, or at least splenic binary. I'm pretty sure it's first tone. And so what's funny is we would take a train ride and he would say, Jonah, I really want you to tell me all about, you know, some area of human design. At one point we had a 36 hour train ride, very long train ride. And so sure enough, day one, I go, yeah, I'm kind of tired right now. Maybe I'll do it later. Okay, sure. So, you know, a few hours pass. Finally, I muster up the energy. Now, during that time, he's active. Remember, he, his mind stays active. He's reading, he's writing, but it's like a very slow roll of activity. It's not like furious activity. It's not like he's like so busy doing all these different things. He's just kind of plodding along, taking notes. Finally, he goes, okay, Jonah, let's talk about it. And I say, okay, let's talk. And then my mind leaps into action. And for the next hour, I give a talk, you know, to Mike and I give him my whole talk and I say, and there it is. Now you know what it's all about. And he goes, okay. And then he asked me a question and I go, you know, I kind of explained all that and I can't really do it. I can't really do it anymore. And, you know, and then he asked me another question. An hour later, he asked me another question. Two hours later, another question. Three hours later, another question. The next day, another question. You know, he doesn't, it's like all my questions jump all at the same time. If somebody comes to me, cause I have an action mind. If they come to me and they tell me a bunch of stuff and my brain kicks into action, my mind kicks into action, I'm going to go, okay, what about this? What about that? What about this? And what about that? And we go through all my questions. When we're done, we're done. And that's it. The action peaks and then is done. Well, it is so hard for me as an action person to interact with first tone people like yourself on, a, on an ongoing basis. Like say we were to have a two hour conversation. It's so hard for me to do that because when I talk to somebody who's action for two hours, we both start really slow, then we both get amped up and get really excited, then we both lose steam and lose energy and get really tired and finally go, whew, that was a good conversation. Um, you know, I don't have anything else to say. Do you have anything else to say? And they go, no, I don't have anything else to say. Jeez, I'm exhausted. You know, it's like we've had a workout. We are exhausted. Our mind is like completely spent. You know what I mean? Well, first tone people like yourself, your mind is never spent. That's what I mean by Mike. Like he wouldn't, he wouldn't spend all his energy. You know, he would, it's kind of like, I want the first tone people to spend all their energy when I'm talking to them because I'm spending all my energy. You better believe it. If we're doing a Zoom talk, my mind is working a million miles a minute. After our Zoom talk, all I want is to have a big sandwich or something because I've burned 500 calories from my mind, you know, pistons firing and whirring. And my mind has been going a million miles a minute. And, you know, after that, I am so exhausted. But the funny thing is, when you have this first tone here, like Mike, you'll never get exhausted because you'll never spend that much energy. You'll always conserve the energy and save the energy. So here I am blowing out all of my energy. And then there's Mike going, huh, okay, but what about this? And he does that for like three days straight. Like, the same amount of energy that I spend in one hour, he spends over 30 hours. And I might have 20 questions all at once, and he only has one question. And then two hours later, he has the next question. And then two hours later, he has the next question. So it's a trickle, drip, trickle, drip sort of thing. It just drips out this always vigilant, always working marathon mind that never really takes a rest. And I don't work that way. I have to take rests. I often have to take rests in the middle of doing these readings. I pause them and then I go in the other room and I have a smoke and I sit outside for a minute and I drink a glass of water and I, you know, stretch a little bit. And then I come back and I keep doing the reading because I'm, I'm just saying, you know, this is a crucial difference in how leftness and rightness works. And even though even within leftness, there's this crucial difference between how the first and second tone work compared to the third tone, which because it's part of the binary with the fourth tone, which is also, you know, which is the division between left variable and right variable, it shares something of rightness. So that's just, you know, just a little bit of a context there that, that if we do have a conversation uh, on phone or video or something, just to be cognizant of the fact that, you know, I'm probably going to have 20 minutes or 30 minutes of activity where my mind can be really active, then I'm going to get exhausted. 
And I've made the mistake before of, you know, scheduling two hour talks with people who have first tone. And the fact of the matter is you can sit there for the whole two hours alert, not spending too much energy, but still kind of always keeping it going. It's like a slow burn. It's like keeping the fire on, keeping the pressure on, keeping the focus on. And, you know, and that's that's fine, but it's just realizing that that's how how your mind works. So you know we'll get to that when we get to the four transformations. I don't want to get too derailed into that. Um, I just kind of wanted to go over leftness and rightness. Okay, so to start with chart characteristics, you have one channel, and you know I usually start by doing a little keynoting of the channels. There's not a lot to keynote when you have one channel. We can do we can do some keynoting when we get to your incarnation cross. You know, um, this is the channel of awakening. So you have one obligation and one obligation only, and that's to be awake, really to be awake. It doesn't matter if other people are awake or not. It doesn't really matter if your partner is into human design. It doesn't really matter if that other person's living their design, except insofar as you gain the quality of their aura, you know, you, you want to be around people who, who are awake because then you get a really good quality aura from them. So that can be really nice, right? It can be nice to get that. But otherwise, this is a very self-centered channel and there's nothing wrong with that. We want to destigmatize selfishness. You know, with this undefined ego here, it's so easy to go, there's something wrong with me. You know, there's something to feel that you have a flaw, but you don't. You know, you're designed for enlightened selfishness. This is like the channel of enlightened selfishness. You're designed to be awake. And this awakeness, what it means to be awake in this life is just to see clearly all the mechanics, just to see with eyes wide open, to see, you know, hey, I'm a projector. I'm designed for one-on-one. -on -one. The second I'm in a group with two people, I can only focus on one of them. The other is going to be mad at me. Simple as that. And with awakeness, you don't have to care. You can see that person getting mad at you. You don't have to take it personally. You don't have to feel like there's any defect. You'll see when we get to the not self analysis part with this undefined ego, it's very easy to feel like you have a defect. It's easy to feel like I'm missing gate 26. I don't have the nerve. You know, if only I had the nerve, then I would have the success. But instead I'm gonna be so bitter because there's something wrong with me because I'm missing the nerve. Or, you know, you don't have to fit the gate 51 there. Something's wrong with me because I'm missing the courage. If only I had more guts and courage, you know, it would all be different. Don't worry about it. You're not here to be that courageous, gutsy, nervy, jump into the unknown person. Self-love for you means loving yourself as you are. Loving your selfishness, loving the self-centeredness, loving that your 2010 is only really concerned with yourself, with what is correct for you. Because guess what? If you don't get correct with yourself, none of the other stuff matters. You know what I mean? <laughs> none of the other stuff matters. Um, yeah, it really doesn't. And so just, just noticing how important it is to honor that 1020. And then it has an obligation to survive and to be empowered, which means it's basically self-protective, self-interested. It's here to be self-preservation um, in some sense, you know, and there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with having a bit of self-preservation. Um, now, this is the voice of now. It's really the voice of now. That's what awakeness is. It's realizing that all of the stuff about tomorrow and yesterday and all that doesn't really matter. It's kind of like, I don't know if you've ever done psychedelics, but if you do psychedelics, you can get to this place where the only thing that really exists is the present moment. It's like the eternal now. And you realize that all the stuff that happened in the past isn't really happening anymore. It's gone. And who knows how it really happened anyway. And the future may never come. I mean, our ideas of the future is really just the now changing. And so you start to realize, wow, like this awakeness in the now, this awakeness to the now is what it's all about. Being able to look out the window and, you know, normally our mind freezes the world in some sense. Obviously, we see motion. We see cars driving, we see people walking, whatever. But if you look at a tree, it takes a second for your mind to kind of unfreeze the tree to see the wind blowing through it. <coughs> it's a good experiment. Try looking out at the leaves of the tree and noticing them blow in the wind. That's a good example of the awakeness of gate 20. You know, when you're really awake with gate 20, 
you're seeing the world in its animation, in its movement. And this actually gets back to a really core, um, I'm gonna take a, I take a pause here in a second. Um, so this actually gets back to a really core point about human design, which is that human design, regardless of your type, is about getting in touch with the movement of reality, the movement of the river of life, the movement of the sequence of events, the movement of the trajectory, the movement of things coming at you, the movement of you moving towards them. All of this movement is what strategy and authority is all about. So when we talk about waiting for the invitation, waiting to respond, all this stuff, that aligns you to movement. Even manifestors, even a splenic manifestor who doesn't have to wait for clarity, they still have to wait for the right timing to initiate. They still have to wait for the splenic hit in the moment to tell them that it's the right time. So what's interesting is what, what human design is really doing is aligning you to movement. And that's what this channel of awakeness is, is really about. It's about being awake to the movement of the world not being off in your head, not being in a frozen inner monologue. Notice the difference between you can only really hear your inner voice or you can notice the wind blow through the trees. You can't do both at the same time in some sense. Like I'm talking to you, I see the trees moving, but I'm still, I'm in my voice, I'm in my head, I'm in my words, I'm not in the trees. Whereas if I stop talking and start to really look out of the trees, I can kind of go there, so to speak, uh, in my mind. Okay, I'm gonna take a very short break. We're gonna come back and keep doing the chart characteristics. Um, next up, we're gonna talk a little bit about your circuitry and then we're gonna get into incarnation cross and do some keynoting. Stay tuned. All right, going back to the preview. So just looking at your circuitry, there's no abstract, there's no tribal or even individual. My note here is that integration is merely proto-individual. So, you know, what do I mean by this? Okay, so abstract is all about sharing with the collective, sharing with strangers. So you're not really here to share with strangers. You know, that's not part of the energy that you put out into the world. Same with tribal. Tribal um, is, instead of, sharing, instead, of, instead of strangers, it's all about close, you know, people who are close to you, that, that you um, support, that support you, you meet their needs, they meet your needs. And then individual, of course, is, um, it has its deep personal attachments and personal connections, um, you know, real personal attachment from one person to the next. And so all three of these you can learn about, you can experience. I mean, this is what's interesting is when you have this much openness in the chart, it's not actually limited because you're really unlimited in the openness. That's where you actually get to experience all of the different varieties of that energy, all the different people who carry that. For instance, you don't have the 4037. You don't have a defined ego or a solar plexus. Same for me. I don't either. Well, okay. So let's just look at that as an example of just, you know, how it works when you have this openness. Well, what this means is throughout your life, you get to meet people who have 4037. And when you meet them, when you're in aura with them, you get to become very wise about what that is. You get to learn about what it really means to be a part of a whole. And you get to learn about what it really means to be part of a group that's bigger than you, where you're supporting them and they're supporting you. And this whole concept of the family, you know, whether it's a literal family or, or, or whether it's a business or something like that, you get to learn about it. And yet there's no requirement in your life that you're a part of that. You don't have to feel like you're part of a family. Like, so I'll have an example. I have a friend who has 4037. He was working in a sales job, making phone calls and so on, and then he quit his job. He really didn't feel like he was part of the family there, but he really wants to join a um, film troupe because joining a, you know, a, a film group is like you're working on the film together. You are part of this, this thing. You're part of this team. And he really wants to be part of the team. He'll never really be satisfied as a generator unless he can be part of that team you know unless he can he can be part of a whole so it puts a requirement to him you know you'll never really achieve success as a projector and you're just going to be bitter if you don't take care of the needs of the 1020 or the requirement of the 1020 which is basically the requirement to stay empowered as yourself the requirement to not sacrifice your own survival for somebody else the requirement to in some sense, 
be a little selfish, to be, to be, you know, um, to be yourself in the now. That's how we keynote this. In fact, I'll add that to our, I'll add that to our comments. Uh, 34 is doing, 57 is knowing, 10 is yourself, and 20 is the now. So, um, you know, so somebody who's a 34 or 20 are just doing things in the now all the time. If they're a 57, 20, that's knowing in the now. If 57, 34 is knowing what they're doing and you can kind of play with them in all different ways. Well, you don't necessarily have the energy to do. In fact, people who have a hanging gate 34, you know, would be able to really activate. I have my friends who I call, um, I mean, some of them anyway, if they have gate 20, like my friend C is one of my task friends who I can get a lot of stuff done. You know why? Because I have gate 34. I have hanging gate 34. And my hanging gate 34 really has all this energy that's just like built up, ready to go, but it doesn't really, you know, it's, just, it's waiting. It's waiting to go. It's waiting to execute. And so when a 20 comes along, like yourself, even though you have the 10 also, that 20 is still available to the 34. And it's still available to the 57, you know? The, the, this little bundle is weird in that the 34 has a hanging gate to the 57, a hanging to the 10, and a hanging to the 20, if that makes sense. You know, so, um, but in any case, yeah, like as soon as a 20 comes along, you know, they're basically providing the manifestation in the now kind of outlet to take action directly in the moment. Everything funnels towards the throat. You can think of the throat as the vortex towards which the entire, you know, the entire chart flows. So this 10 is flowing towards, towards the 20. Okay, so what else do I have to say about your, your 10, 20? Your 10 is in line four. So that kind of adds an extra, almost as if you're a fourth line profile too. It adds an extra sort of profile requirement. I'll add this in the notes too. Um, 10 for list. So, you know, simple enough adds a sort of secondary fourth line profile effect. You know, anytime you have um, gate 10, it's going to be a role gate and it's going to talk about what your role is. And so, because you have that 10 for um, fixed and exaltation and detriment, which is also interesting. Uh, you know, we can look at it down here. Um, oh, it just says fixed and exaltation here. It doesn't say the detriment. Interesting. Well, in any case, it's all about, you know, the opportunist that we would call the, the opportunist, um, you know, from um, profile, usually, right? This is where we get the word, pro, you know, the gate 10 line three is the martyr, gate 10 line two is the hermit and so on. So we have gate 10 line four, that's, that's the opportunist. So what this means is in addition to being a martyr heretic, you're also an opportunist, right? Or you also have that quality that that sort of need um, to get opportunities through your friend group. Um, so I would say fourth line rules apply more or less. So there are fourth line rules for fourth line profiles, right? If you have a fourth line profile, we say don't quit your job till you have another job. Don't leave your lover until you have another lover. Well, this kind of applies to you also because you have the 10 four. It's kind of one of your requirements. I mean. It's, it becomes an important part of who you are. And it works different than profile, obviously. I mean, it's not your profile. Your profile is the three five. But when you have a activation in gate 10, it kind of acts like a secondary profile. It kind of imposes a secondary requirement. So not, now you're not only required to have that three five profile, you know, sort of thing. You're also required to have, um, Fourth line, uh, yeah, I'm just going to add these. Um, bonds need broken and um, seduced. So forget about it. Okay, I just added some notes there because um, I want to make sure we don't we don't forget the fourth line when we get to talking about profile. So we're talking about profile for a while. <coughs> Excuse me. 
so yeah, this 1020, I mean, I just want to kind of sit with it. And, you know, by the way, feel free to skip forward in the reading if it ever gets boring, if anything. I mean, to me, it's like I just sit and ruminate on something. I have the 952, uh, which is something, you know, you have it open so you can kind of experience people like me and go, wow, that person really likes to sit still for a long time with the same thing. Um, I just like to sit on it until I've exhausted everything I have to say about it. Okay, so let me just think what else I have about the 1020, just if there's anything else here. And then we'll move on to your incarnation calls. Mm, I guess for me, pure integration, I've always associated with nature. I've always associated with being out in nature, with having a connection to animals, having a connection to plants, um, you know, integration circuitry even has a connection to insects, for instance. Um, who have that same 1020 and gate 20 can be thought of as the sort of buzz of the insect the bzzz, you know they're kind of existential buzzing um, i've always wondered if certain self-help modalities are better suited uh, for certain people for instance eckhart tolle or toll i'm not sure how to say his name i think it's tolle he's um he's a self-help author who i've never really found any value in but i don't have gate 20 or gate 10 and I've wondered if people who have these particular gates may get more benefit because he's always talking about, he's talking about the power of now, and, you know, what it means to be in the now and, and to be fully in the moment and so on. So you, you might consider looking, looking into that. The other thing is, this is the very end of the mystical way. So here's something else I can tell you. You have the beginning and the end of the mystical way. How cool is that? I'll put that in the notes too. Um, Okay, so the human mystical way begins in gate 19. And gate 19 holds a lot of values. You know, it's, it's different values. Uh, it has different qualities, I should say, that um, coexist. I mean, it's very multivalent. It's multivalued. And so one of its values is the beginning of the human mystical way where it leads to the 49. And this is really all about the foundation of the priesthood and the Eucharist, sacrifice of meat, this is about, um, it's the channel where it's basically the channel of sacrificing animals from the herd. It's actually a channel that's breaking down. The 1949 is breaking down during our 2027 mutation. But that 1949 is fundamentally what allows us to connect. The 19 is a, is a gate that mammals have, that five centered mammals have, like cows and pigs and sheep, and goats, stuff like that. And so with our you know 49 in the solar plexus, we have the ability, particularly people who have a hanging gate 49 can be real shepherds and or people who have the whole channel as well, have this sort of ability to domesticate the mammal. And part of the domestication of the mammal is the eventual eating of the mammal, the sacrifice of the mammal. Now, this also links, if you've read The Golden Bow by Fraser or Totem and Taboo by Freud, this links to um, classic, you know, peoples of antiquity doing, um, there's a guy named Rene Girard also, he looked at, he calls it mimetic desire, and it's desire that imitates other desire, and essentially his theory of mimetic desire goes back to totem and taboo, and goes back to the golden bow, and things like this, and looks at early scapegoating, it's a theory of scapegoating, and of sacrifice, you know, sacrifice of the king or sacrifice or scapegoat of the scapegoat. And so this 1949, this is like really a fundamental beginning of mysticism and beginning of religion, even if you think of it that way. Uh, now, this doesn't have a lot of personal value for you. We'll, we'll look at your gate 19 when we get to your not self analysis. Uh, I'm just kind of telling you to give you context, which is that, you know, you have this 19. So you always have this potential, especially when you meet somebody who has a hanging 49 um for there to be that sort of tribal partnership that harkens back to the very early early partnerships based on um support and so on and then and then ultimately to be to be able to domesticate mammals in this domestication you can see it's really the 49 that domesticates you're not the domesticator in this scenario you're the one being domesticated so to speak uh by the 49s out there and that's what the 19 does, the 19 flirts. And then the 49 says, because the 19 is basically trying to elicit resources. It's saying, I'm gonna flirt and then show me what you got. 
Then the 49 comes along and says, here's all my resources. Here's my cars and here's my house and here's my money and all this stuff. And then the, the 49 says, okay, great. I like you. Now let's have this bond, this sticky glue bond of tribal. You know, the tribal bond is always sticky. It's marriage bond or something like that. Even if you don't technically get married, you're always kind of married with the tribal bond. And, um, you know, you get to that. And then in that tribal bond, um, you, you basically never flirt again. <laughs> the 19 stops flirting completely. And that 49, you know, domesticates them, so to speak. So this is what happens with mammals as well, with the five-centered beings. Obviously, it works very different with nine-centered humans. We're not mammals, and I don't mean to draw that comparison, other than in this specific way that this is the channel of domestication. But it's also very mystical because it's the beginning of religion and the beginning of mysticism. And then what we find is as this tribalism continues onto the 3740, this whole block, 1949, 3740, that connects together. Just imagine, like, here, maybe I can just let me draw. In. Yeah. So, like, let me just look at uh, what's white. Let me, <laughs> sorry about that. Uh, let me change it to, here we go. Yeah. So, let's just pick a color. That's not perfect. So, we see that 1949. Let me get rid of this. Um, well, I don't know why it's. Oh, I see it's doing the outline. Here, that one too. Maybe it's this one. Yeah. There we go. So there's the 1949. It continues up to the 3740. So you can see that this is the beginning of the human mystical way. Now, what happens here is it leaves the ego at 50 to get to 25, which you also have. So you actually have four gates from the human mystical way. Um, to make this practical, you know, what it means at a practical level is that you may have mystical experiences in your life, particularly through your 2010. Uh, but otherwise, you know, there's not a ton of practical value other than in the context of mystical encounter, uh, which is something we could, we could talk about separately because that's kind of out of the purview of this. Um, but, you know, I mean, it's interesting. But so it, then it goes to the 5125 and then it goes to the 10, 20. So this is the human mystical way. That's the human mystical experience right there. And you, you have quite a bit of it, you know. Um, you have four out of, out of the seven gates. Or I guess there's, oh, there's eight. Yeah, eight. So you have four out of eight. Okay. So let's, uh, I'll get rid of that one now. Let's get back to where we were. So yeah, I just wanted to make sure I've told you as much about the, the this, you know, 10, 20 as I can. So what do you, how do you notice as a self-projected projector now? I guess we can talk about this. So self-projected projector, you know, it, you're going to be trusting the words that you say out of, that you hear yourself say. So one thing that can be really nice would be to actually record yourself speaking. Um, maybe start a YouTube channel, YouTube has an auto transcription feature um, that will automatically transcribe to text. And so I've done this where I will actually not record um, to release to the public sometimes. I'll just record as like voice transcription on my voice memos on my iPhone. Then I just throw it in iMovie, put a blank image or just like a dummy image because you have to have some sort of image there. And I click upload to YouTube, automatically uploads as a private video. Then I wait a day or whatever and I check back and it's auto generated the closed captions. And I actually get this really nice free, free speech to text transcription. Um, and so it can be really nice. I mean, as a, as a self-projected projector, the most important thing for you in trusting your authority is going to be hearing yourself say the words. And you can see which words are not you. You can really see what's not you. For instance, that eight is not you. So saying, um, I can help. I can help. That's not you. Don't volunteer. Here, I'm gonna add, I'm gonna put some of these in the notes. Um, I'll say voices of the throat. Learn them and get familiar with them. And notice when you are saying ones that are or aren't you. So this is something Ra would talk about. Like he didn't have gate 35. You don't have gate 35. I don't have gate 35. Anytime we start a sentence with, I feel, 
I feel doesn't work. I, you know, I feel like this is going well. That's not me. That is not me. I have found that's me because I have the voice of I have. That's Skate 45. When you start a, you know, a sentence with I have, that's not you. When you start a sentence with I remember, that is you. When you start a sentence with I know, that is you, right? You say, I know, or I don't know what you mean by that. I don't know what the difference between this and that is. See, that's you because that's gate 23. The I know or I don't know. I'm just gonna write it down here. So that's you. And then, um, you know, I remember is you or I remember. Same thing. I don't remember is you, et cetera. With, um, I guess, gate 16. 16 is I experiment. But it's basically, um, I've been trying this out lately. I've been experimenting with this lately. It's that kind of thing. Um, and then what else do you have? You have uh, 20, 60, no, that's it. So you have those four. So you have, I mean, your gate 20 is the gate of um, now. I am now. It's like I am in the now. It's the voice. It really is mystical. If you think about what it is to be in the now, this is some like Ram Das be here now stuff. Uh, oh, hey, here, I'll give you some reading homework if you like. Uh, okay, reading homework. Ram Das be here now. Eckhart Tolle, maybe. Power of now. Um, and then Fraser, the golden bow. Freud, totem and taboo. Is it Boa Fraser? What's his name? Boa. Something like that. Fraser Boa. No. Who wrote the Golden Bow? One second. James George Fraser. That's his name. Okay. And then uh, so I'm, I'm just writing down a few books as a kind of recommendation if you wanted. And then also Bataille. Um, he wrote a great book called Theory of Religion. Oh yeah, and and Gerard. Anything on magnetic desire? Okay, so I wrote some I wrote some good books you could find. Um, Okay, so I just put some I just put some some notes in there. So yeah, so looking at these voices of the throat, you really want to just kind of notice yourself, listen to yourself, record yourself, ask your friends, tell your friends. It's really fun if you have friends who are in the HD experiment. I mean, that's what's cool is if you can start up like a weekly group, like we have HD Catalyst group here in Santa Fe. And when you have a group, it's so much fun because you know if you came to the group, we would all know you and we would know your chart. We all know each other's charts. And if there's a self-projected projector who's in the experiment, we, we can kind of point out to them, hey, you just said yesterday this, now you're saying this, you know, or, or we could point out like, sometimes it's not even about noticing how what you're saying is changing. It's just noticing what you're saying, period. I mean, I, I, you've probably heard it if you, because you watch my, you know, YouTube, but I have this long joke now of my, my friend. He's actually, he's an actor, he's a public figure. So I can say who he is, his name's Andrew Banowitz. And he's a self-projected projector. He's a four six, and uh, he'll say, "Jonah, I I want to quit my job and I want to move, and I think my girlfriend's breaking up with me, and everything's going bad, and I don't know what to do. What should I do?" And I'm like, "Quit your job, break up with your girlfriend, and move." Like, literally, the self-projected projector can say exactly what they need. It's so beautiful for them to be able to say, "I really don't like this person, and I don't enjoy this, and I really want to go there." It's like they just have this direct like narration of their G center, you know, that's possible anyway, that's possible. What happens is it gets so distorted by the not self. When we get to the not self, we'll see how distorted ego can make it so, you know, um, oops, weird. okay. That distorted ego can, you know, make it really hard to stay in your 1020 and stay in listening to your truth. And you can make all sorts of actions because of that ego or, you know, same thing here. We have, uh, oh, weird, this is, to do that okay i'm gonna change back to my other tool i think that'll be the best color either okay. 
Okay, so um, yeah, you just really want to notice what you're saying. I mean, this is the name of the game. But as you'll see when we get to the not self, you know, the not self side of it is just not the not self side of it is definitely um, going to interfere. You know, when we get to these these centers, and it's not going to necessarily be easy to always do what you're saying. You're now doing like you say like I am now leaving. I am now, I mean, to say I am now anything really is your truth. And the funny thing is, it's such an existential truth. Say you're having a huge emotional breakdown with somebody. You're not designed to have a huge emotional breakdown. You're not designed to be in a big emotional thing. You're not designed to handle all that. It's like plugging a 220 into a 110 volt. You can't handle this huge emotional thing. They're yelling at you and they're crying and you're crying. Just leave. You should say, I am now leaving the aura for a while. And I am now, you know what I mean? Or like, you, you know, you can't force yourself to say it mentally, but you basically just leave or you notice yourself saying that, that you just can't, that, that you, you can't be now in that situation any longer. Once you leave, you breathe through all those emotions, which by the way, you get to become really wise about emotions. That doesn't mean you're naturally wise about emotions. People who have undefined solar plexus like us, are not naturally wise about emotions. We naturally bottle them up. We naturally explode. We naturally try to run away from them. We naturally avoid them. We naturally, you know, all of the not self stuff. We have to learn. We have to nurture and cultivate our learning and our wisdom through our experience of emotions. So just to give you one example, if you're having a huge emotional crisis, the level of the 35, 36, or that 30, 41, which you'll learn to recognize, it's an emotional crisis that just feels like a roller coaster. It just feels like you've just been dashed on the rocks of fate, you know, and, you know, maybe you're heartbroken, who knows what. When you need to walk and breathe at the same time, maybe you're angry as hell. Maybe somebody did something, you're mad as hell about it, who knows what. Um, you go for a walk while you breathe because moving and breathing is part of the 35, 36. Okay, 1222 is different. If you have a 1222, this is like that romantic heartbreak or that shock where you can, this is like romance being dashed. I mean, this can be devastating. This is the channel of romance and it can lead to so much anger. I mean, it's a manifestor channel. It could just explode with anger. Just because you don't have this channel doesn't mean this doesn't affect you. I mean, your whole life you've been susceptible to and at key junctures, Maybe there's been a transit with a 1222. Maybe somebody else had the 1222 and you were amplifying it, but you've always been vulnerable to their emotional outburst and their extreme anger. And then you being the one to express that. Well, again, if you are feeling that 1222, to me, it can feel like it gets stuck and like a lump in the throat. You know, when that happens, you have to sing, sing and do breathing exercises, even alone. Um, 4037. Say you're having a big tribal or 1949, you know, and by the way, the last one with the singing also goes for the 3955, but any tribal emotional stuff, that tribal emotional, and you're feeling this, this lack of support, this betrayal, this disloyalty, maybe the bitterness over all that you do for them and you slave away for them and they don't ever give back and it's not fair. These are the feelings of the tribal bitterness. It's all about fairness. It's all about support, need, they haven't met your needs, all this stuff. Well, you can become really wise about how you can then hug that person. And while you are holding them, like a parent and child, you breathe, you synchronize your breathing. So you're breathing in the exact same way. That's tribal breathing. So I'm just saying, just as an example of these three kinds of breathing, uh, here, I'll write this in the notes too, because it's kind of practical. Three kinds of breathing for dealing with heavy, big emotional stuff. Tribal breathing, breathing with the other person, right? Holding them. Um, you know, uh, experiential breathing, <laughs> abstract, collective circuitry. Breathing, which is breathing while walking or moving, dancing and so on. And then, um, and then there's individual breathing breathing and singing. Yeah, and also diaphragmatic breathing.
Yeah. So, okay. So that's just an example. That's just an example of how this works, right? Like you have this openness here. Doesn't mean that you're never going to experience emotions. Quite the opposite. You're probably going to be a hyper emotional person who's like what they would call an empath, you know, who's very emotional because other people are happy. You're feeling it even happier and they're sad and you're even sadder and even lower. And what human design does is it allows you to witness this, which immediately changes the quality from amplification to what's a better word for it um you learn to savor it you learn to experience it you learn to sit in it you learn to live in it see that's the other thing is like this reading might be extremely maddening to you because you have undefined root you might be like hurry up jonah what are you doing but i'm savoring this reading like i don't know what i'm gonna say i have undefined throat i have undefined head i have undefined ajna all I want to do is give you my time, and I don't even have a certain amount of time. Some readings I do in an hour and a half, others take three hours. I'm just giving you the reading that I can give you based on my speed today. I'm moving pretty slow today because I've had a really busy time, so I'm kind of moving at half mast. I'm also like enjoying myself during the reading and kind of taking time and thinking about things that are interesting to me and allowing myself to go into that. Um, you know what I mean? And so this is. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, I mean, this is how I do all my readings, really. This is, I just have to trust myself and trust in my process. But I guess what I'm trying to say is these undefined centers are always going to interfere. And you're going to start to notice their interference. And you'll notice that, you know, with that undefined root, it'll interfere by saying, hurry up. And that undefined sacral will interfere by saying, we need more. And that undefined spleen will interfere by saying, it's not done yet. And, you know, it won't want to let go when things are finished. When someone's dead, your story with them is finished. Let go, they're dead. When someone breaks up with you, you know, besides being a third line with the potential to reopen the relationship, but besides that, just act as if it's gone forever. That's okay, let go of it, you know? When, when so each of these centers, you know, it, it'll flare up. When someone threatens you, just tell yourself, I don't have to respond to threat. It's not my job to counter threat. It's not my job to counter threaten them even bigger. Because what happens is the undefined centers, you know, we gain wisdom through them over time. But that wisdom over time is not automatic. It's not something we get for free. You know, something we learn. Uh, just a moment. I'm gonna I'm gonna grab a glass of water. All right, I just had some water. Um, so the other interesting thing here is I want to talk a little bit. I mean, I've been talking about this on my YouTube channel, so you've probably seen this, but I want to talk about um, the channels and the sense of obligations. So Ra had the 1020, but he also had the 4323. He also had the 5710. He also had the 5720. He also had the 2551. Um, he had all these obligations. He was obligated to structure with his channel of structuring the initiation with 2551 into perfected form with 5710 into the awakening into perfected form. So you have the awakening part, but you know, his obligation, so to speak, was really greater and also more limited in yours. Now, the other interesting thing though, is, you know, you look at, you look at Ra and you look at what his obligation was, and you even look at his incarnation process, his personality son, you look at his channels. He was only really obligated for himself. That's what's so funny. He was only really obligated to just live for himself. And so it's, you know, what a great gift that he was able to be so collective. And I think what it shows me is that, and it shows anyone who really studies human design, that you actually do get to have the dream of the not self, but only through living correctly. So it's so ironic. It's such a tasty irony that you might like as an unconscious fifth line, which is so associated with irony, is that there's such a beautiful, delicious irony here. Before you come into human design, the not self wants to be everything. I'm, I'm making a box around it because it literally, you know, it's like it wants to have all 64 gates active. Like you want to be really good at asking the right questions, really good at, at thinking about the interesting questions, really good at, at, at dealing with the pressure of the confusion, really good at making sense of the confusion, good at returning to the questions, good at answering the questions, good at coming up with ideas, good at having opinions, good at structuring things, good at expressing that structure, good at being stimulated and expressing the ideas good at expressing all the details, good at, you know, and you like every single gate, doesn't matter if you have it or not, 35, 36, everyone wants to be sexy, the channel of sexual competence, 
1648, skill. Everyone wants to be talented and skilled, be able to sit down at the piano and play the amazing piano music. You know what I mean? 10, sorry, uh, one eight, very um, comedic, comedian and funny and verbal gunslinger. Everyone wants to have a snappy comeback and be really witty, right? Everyone wants to be every single channel. And we get to be every single channel. <laughs> We just get to either be it as a puppet marionette on the string where somebody's pressing our buttons and someone comes along and we get to experience the 2145 or the, you know, the anger of the 2145, the anger of the 1222, the anger of the 3536. You don't have any of these, any activation here. So you know what that's going to be is um, a theme of denial and blame of what anger? I'm not an angry person. I don't have anger. There's no anger here, you know, we can talk about this more when we get to the not self, but you know you're going to have this sort of denial of anger. This blind spot around anger, but the fact of the matter is before human design. You know, we all want to have the good quality of this the 4521 is regal and it acts it's dignified like a king or a queen. The 1222 is romantic and poetic the 3536 is sexy and adventurous you know, and they, they have these qualities, we all want to have these, the 4037 is dependable, reliable, supportive, affectionate, hardworking, has a great capacity, you know, the 4426 is really good at making money, like, all of these things, we want to have them, that 731 is really good at knowing the leadership direction to go and being a leader, we all want to have every single one of them. But what human design does is it basically shows you, no, you're just this one channel here. That's it. That's all you have to do. And as long as you do that, you're going to feel really good in this life. You're going to feel that success in your aura. You're not going to have a bitter aura that's like jealous of other people. You're not going to have a hater aura that's hating on other people who are more successful than you. You're not going to have any of that stuff because you've deconditioned from that and you're meeting your requirement. You are required to be selfish. You are required to be awake. You are required to sort of be this survivalist integration. You know, it's not just integration, it's individuation too. You're required to individuate, to go in that deep individuation journal journey, maybe journaling as well, and to go deep within yourself and really discover that deep individuation. You're also here to be and to find, because you know, you have a defined G center. You have to find your community, find the right people for you, find the right auras that you enjoy being around, find the right sacral to program you, find the right ego that feels good to be around, find the right emotional solar plexus that that person is clear on their emotions. They're not repressing their emotions. They're not dumping and discharging their emotions. They're not freaking out about their emotions. You know, you can find all of the people that have the defined centers that are empty for you. So here's what I'm trying to say is like, before you get into human design, the not self is trying to be everything. So your whole life, you've been trying to prove that you have the capacity and the support, you know, to support people. And you've been trying to model, you know, all the stuff that's not you and trying to prove, how, you know, that you can be any of these things that aren't you, right? And what happens is once you get to the human design, you start deconditioning and you start really living as you and going, this is all I really have to do. I just have to wait for the invitations. I just have to trust my 1020. I have to trust what my G center is telling me, my innate compass. It's my inner direction in life. It's always taking me to the right place at the right time. You know, and as soon as I trust that and I stop falling prey to all of this other stuff, um, what happens is you begin to sort of surf the waves and then somebody enters your life who has a 4037, you get to experience that 4037 through them. Somebody enters your life who has the 3536, you get to experience that 3536. Wow, talk about fireworks, you know, and you get to experience that. But you get to experience it as yourself, experiencing it as them. Or you have a transit come along and the 1222 transit come along and then temporarily this dormant side of you comes to life, but it's not as a marionette puppet on the string. It's not like a 220 plugged into a 110 amplifying and ratcheting it up and leading to all this bitterness and leading to blowing out your, your you know, solar plexus with anger and with over emotionality. It, it's not like that. It's not like the 1222 comes along and you have some angry explosion of emotions and crying, you know, or some crazy thing happens or you're impulsive. And no, because part of the human design is you're learning to become wise of it. You learn how, when you get really emotional like that, 
it's not the right time to take any action. You don't need to initiate action. You know, you've probably heard a million times people on their emotional wave aren't supposed to act when they're feeling really emotional. Well, that's true for you too. That's true for you, absolutely, just as much and more so, and true for me. I'm emotionally undefined also, but I'll tell you, before human design, I was the most emotional person I knew because those emotions would plug into me and would charge me up and amp me up. And now what's funny is I, there's a 1222 transit going on right now. I'm experiencing being emotional, but you know what? It's not amping me up in the same way. It's not blowing me out in the same way. It's not like I'm, you know, amping up that energy. So that's what I kind of mean is that before you come to human design, you want to be all 64 gates. You want to be all nine centers. Then you find out, oh, dang, I only have this one channel. I'm so disappointed. I only have this one little thing and I'm not actually all this other stuff. But then you actually get to learn that through wisdom and through like, I mean, it's really great. Human design is so cool because what you get to learn is like you have to give up on ever trying to be any of those things. Give up and let go of the idea of yourself of like, having to give other people sexy excitement that's 35 36 you know or having to give other people romance that's 12 22 or having to give other people support 37 40 or 1949 or any of these right and once you let go of all of that funny enough it kind of comes back in a different form and then pretty soon there's a 35 36 transit and you're having the most incredible exciting experiences of your life but it's as you, and then you get to have this exciting, you know, almost like amazing version of that, but it's becoming wise about that. You get to collect. I like to think of all of the openness in the chart as where we become wise, right? As where we are collecting everything. It's like buckets that just fill up and it just collects it all. And so with your undefined solar plexus, you get to collect things that, are, that you know are exciting to do. And you get to, as an undefined ego, you get to collect things that are trustworthy and, and so on. Uh, you get to collect, you know, ways of telling if you can trust someone. You get to collect ways of figuring out if something is fair or not, because you don't innately know if it's fair, right? Um, with that undefined sacral, you get to collect ways of doing things. Someone with a defined sacral is going to come along and they're going to say, this is how you do this, and, you know, and so on. Someone with an undefined G center gets to collect from you your direction and your way of doing something with that defined G. You say, this is the, you know, I think the G and the sacral are both about doing things in a way. That's kind of, this is the tantric area. This is where the doing happens in the direction and the, you know. Uh, but in any case, okay, so let's move on a little bit. I'm gonna do a little more chart characteristics and then we're gonna, uh, so for our chart characteristics, we're going to talk about incarnation cross. And incarnation cross is something I get asked about a lot. So it's probably one of the things that's most interesting to people is their incarnation cross. And I see why. I see why, because the incarnation cross gives us a hint at our purpose. You look at Ra's incarnation cross, and he's a cross of the clarion. And sure enough, he was da -da -da -da, the clarion to tell us that human design is here and that the door is closing and, you know, and to announce all of this stuff. And he fulfilled his life purpose by announcing all of this stuff. Um, and yet we can also see that he was here to structure the initiation into the awakening of perfected form. And that was based on his channels. So we see that the channels are the only real obligation that you have. So the obligation is the channels, and yet the incarnation cross does have something to do with the purpose. And it's particularly how the mind comes out. And we'll get to this when we get to the four transformations, because the four transformations are really another version of the incarnation cross. We don't think of it that way, but the four transformations are more like the personal version of the incarnation cross. The incarnation cross is what does the program want to do uh, with you? Here, I'll scroll down to it. See it. Um, what does the program want to do? with you and the determination and environment and all of that is kind of like what does do you get as your benefit from it but it's the same thing this is your incarnation cross it is the sun earths and it is the nodes right and if you were to look at it on one side or the other well sorry the incarnation cross is just the sun earths so the determination is the nodes i guess determine 
the four transformations, I, I misspoke. The four transformations are a combination of incarnation cross and the cross of life. The cross of life is, there's, there's really two crosses of life, but one of them on the personality side is the sun, earth, and then the nodes. And that's kind of the main one. And then on the design side, but I mean, the design side is also kind of the main one in a different way. It's the main one of the life, of the design, of the form. So they're both valid. But in any case, when you combine the personality and the design crosses of life with the incarnation cross, which I misspoke earlier, it is the sun earths on the personality and design side, right? So when you, when you combine those, you actually get the four transformations, which is the whole thing. But first, we're just going to look at the sun earths. Okay, so the sun earths are really about what your personality and your unconscious's personality, which we call the design, are here to do. And they're here to work together, and they're really programmed to do this. And so this really is what the program has for you. Like, there's nothing that exciting about Incarnation Cross. For me, like, my Incarnation Cross of healing is like, well, what does the program want me to do? It wants me to... Um, demonstrate the healing power of love. Wants me to succeed where others fail. It wants me to, um, you know, as not self, try to control people as the, their sort of healer and savior. As the true self, to, to sort of have the heresy that nobody can heal you except yourself. And that only self-love is the, the only true healing, although the healing power of love uh, is also real. So, but you know, I mean, it, that, that's what my cross is. And yet, when you look at my channels, my 2946, my 952, that's kind of what I'm doing. My 952 is sitting here for long hours, concentrating and focusing. My 2946 is committing to an experience, not knowing where it's going to end up, but committing myself till the end, till the end. This is the interesting thing. I, don't, I realized early on that I can't set a time limit for my readings because I have a 2946. So my 2946 is the commitment to an experience until the end. And so if I start the reading, I have to finish it. I can't just let it be half finished. And the thing is, some days I'm not doing great, but I have to call it like, okay, I'm just going to commit to it. And I'm going to make my way through it, even if it's a little rough and tumble. And someone asked me, they said, Jonah, are some of your readings better or worse? And I said, no, they're all different. But because I commit myself to get through to the end, even if it's even if it's like like this reading, for instance, I'm a little bit haggard because I've just been haggard. My last like five readings, I've been pretty haggard compared to some of my earlier readings. I was much more like alert or something like that. But you know what? I've been like loving the stuff that's been coming out of my readings lately. I've been finding that there's like new things coming out in readings that never happened in previous readings. I'm getting way more personal with people. I'm getting way more comfortable just going into different areas of the chart and talking more freely about their chart. And yeah, it might be a little bit meandering and so on, but that's what the notes are for. You can always just look at the notes if you ever get lost and then you get, you know, just go back to the notes. So it's kind of, it's been really nice for me to see how my incarnation cross is really just what the program wants for me or what kind of automatically happens without thinking about it. And that my channels are more like what's personally satisfying to me. Your channel is what's going to really bring you your signature. Like when I do my 2946, when I do my 952, that's what really brings me satisfaction. Oh, I'm, I'm already feeling the satisfaction of doing this reading for you. I've been building up to it. I've been wanting to do it. I've been taking the notes and now I'm getting to do it. And afterwards, I can't tell you how good it's going to feel when I'm done. And that feeling of satisfaction, of having made it to the end and having made it through a reading, um, you know, it's, it's, it's great. It's a wonderful feeling. It's a wonderful feeling. And I get the reward of that satisfaction because my 2946 is committed to the end and I'm not letting my not self get in the way. The not self might go, hey, Jonah, you know, you got to keep it to a certain amount of time or hey, Jonah, you better stay on track here. You better not talk about that. You know, don't go into that area. I have an undefined throat. I don't know what I'm going to say. People pay me because they want me to tell them authentically and honestly what I see. And that's what I'm doing. I'm just looking at your chart and telling you the best of my ability what I see. Okay, so in any case, your incarnation cross just kind of set the context. You don't really have to think about it. You don't have to worry about it. You don't have to try to do it. Really, the thing to pay more attention to is the channel. That was my real point there. 
that I don't really pay attention to my cross of healing. I pay attention to my 952 and my 2946. I pay attention, am I committing my sacral energy? 2946 is, you know, committing energy to stay with something till the end. Am I committing it correctly? Am I really doing a sacral uh-huh? Or am I just mentally saying yes, because I think I have to or whatever. Um, and then with my 952, same thing, noticing when it's an action, noticing what it wants to do, noticing when I want to sit still and I can't make myself move and push myself to do something. Um, and then go, and then honoring that, right? So you honor your channels. You don't honor your incarnation cross, you know? In some sense, the incarnation cross is the propaganda from the programming, you know, anyway. But I don't want to make it out that it's about that or anything. Now, the right angle cross of the four ways is an interesting one to me. I have this as my Saturn cross. So my Saturn cross, I'm in a cross of the four ways way of being right now. And um, that's kind of the mode. And that's, you know, the four ways are really just all about movement. It's like a human signpost kind of thing. And it's all about endings in different ways. It doesn't have gate 42, the ultimate gate of endings, but it does have the four directions, uh, the four directional, it's like 24 is returning. There's, there's approach, there's, you know, so you can kind of in, you know, the uh, gate of approach, all the stuff, it's like the four directional gates in some sense, but they're not in the G center. It's not like the four directional gates of the Sphinx. So it's not, it's interesting, you know, the cost of the four ways is what I'm learning about. What, what I like to do is challenge myself to string together the keynotes in my own way to essentially um, put them together based on only the personality and design sun earths. And so that's what we're gonna do here. Uh, I'm actually just going to string together the personality design sun earths. If you're interested in, you know, finding more about this, there's there's our books and lectures by Ra, and we can always talk about it. And you, you know, I could possibly send you some resources or you can always find resources on Incarnation Cross, but instead of reading what Ra had to say, which is kind of his synthesis, uh, which could be really cool, but I just want to try our own synthesis because this is a nice challenge. Uh, it's really fun for me to do. I just want to give it a try. Okay, and I'm going to kind of take notes uh, as I do it. Okay, so your personality sun, gate 33, line three, spirit. And then we have a blue line here. Now, the blue lines are always potentials that are possible, maybe even in the post Chiron, like they're wisdom potentials. So there's a wisdom potential to ultimately possibly turn retreat into victory, but there's no guarantee. So then what happens normally, depending on what side is pulled out of this, the responsible and principled retreat based on preservation, but with the determination to persevere. So this is like, the good side of it is like smart retreat. Like we're losing in battles, so we should run away. It's like, it's like responsible and principled retreat that maintains the spirit. But the negative side is a lack of responsibility and retreat, the bridge burner, the drive for privacy that will cut off its relationships abruptly. So I'm gonna say um, private, um blocking no contact bridge burning uh let's see those are the notes um silent treatment taking no responsibility for a driver uh, okay so private to a fault that's gonna be my mind okay so what i'm gonna do is i'm actually gonna take the notes I won't read them yet. I'm going to read them at the end, but I'm just going to take the notes for either side, the exalt or the uh, detriment. Okay. Responsible principled retreat based on preservation. So it's going to be um, private to preserve one's own spirit and success and privacy, success through privacy, even victory through retreat. Okay, I'm just taking notes. Now, the next one we have, the personality, Earth, 19.3, dedication. So, um, spirited, dedicated, uh, 
sorry, irresponsible, okay, vert and most lack of litigation would be uh, careless. Okay, so, okay, exalt. Uh, I'm just writing in the, in the uh, exalted. So I'm just writing the exalted and the detriments. Okay, so the exalted here is going to be, well, first of all, the blue line, receptivity to approach that can only be maintained through vigilance. So it's interesting. It's like, this is retreat and this is approach. And so anytime you have, you're gonna have both approach and retreat. It's so funny being on this, this four directional cross of the four ways. So receptivity to approach that can be maintained through vigilance. And so that's the possibility, the potential. Now at the, at the best, that the exaltation, people say that we shouldn't say exalts and detriments are best and worst. I don't think so. I think they are best and worsts. I mean, they are the good and the bad of the normal world. If you have a fixed detriment, no big deal. You just have something that's bad to the rest of the world. You can still appreciate it and love it as it is. Okay, I think I'm gonna take a break after this one um, and switch. I'm using a new chair. I love, I love this chair. It's a really cool chair, but there's no back on it. And uh, I'm just realizing that after, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been about an hour and a half. And, uh, I'd like to change one last chair. So I'm gonna change after this. But in any case, okay. So we'll finish this up and then we'll take a short break. You can um, also take a break if you've been watching this in real time. Uh, I always encourage people to take breaks. And also I encourage people to eat while they're listening because eating while learning is a great way to absorb the information at a cellular level because those cells that are going in your digestive system, the enzymes are breaking them down and then they're actually being used to produce new cells. And the new cells have a new design crystal that's basically being imprinted at that moment of cell generation of abiogenesis or you know whatever the, the term is cell genesis and um at that moment you know as you're eating and you're learning it kind of imprints the cells and it helps helps learning better okay so we're going to keep going with the um keynoting here the natural ease with which communion is maintained so i'll say maintaining community Sensitivity and ease fueled by acceptance by others. Um, sensitivity and an accepting atmosphere. Um, and then the detriment, the tendency to moodiness that may lead to carelessness. The need to be wanted hampered by oversensitivity. Um, tendency, oh yeah, because gate, gate 19 is flirting and it's wanting to be wanted. So needing to be wanted, it's a support, it's a tribal gate, it's all that needs, so needing to be wanted by others, but at its detriment, it won't allow its need to be wanted. Like it's healthy for you to need to be wanted in some sense. And that it's, when that's hampered by your oversensitivity, it, that's the detriment. When the oversensitivity doesn't allow you to, to express that need to be wanted, that flirtation in some sense. So the natural ease of this community, okay, so the detriment would be um, moodiness, um, moodiness, carelessness, and oversensitivity. Okay. Um, now we go on to the design sun, gate 24, line five, confession. The courage to admit the mistakes of the past. So oh, I should start writing the wisdom here. Uh, I'll say potential wisdom. Courage to admit mistakes of the past. Um, knowing when to retreat or knowing having a healthy having a healthy attitude that knows when to withdraw or retreat. And uh, receptivity to approach, a vigilant receptivity to approach. So I mean to always be like, no, 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 it's fine. You can come to me, come to me, come to me. That's fine. I'm, I'm always receptive. I'm always open. And I mean to like constantly remind people that you're open, continually reminding people you are open to approach. 
So these are the kind of the blue lines, the potential wisdom. Uh, and there is no potential wisdom of the design earth, unfortunately. It's in Scorpio. Sorry, joking. It is in Scorpio, though. Okay, so here we go. So um, the courage to admit mistakes of the past, the exaltation, the practical value of starting with a clean slate symbolized by the new moon, rational correction that opens the way to new possibilities. So, um, or the tendency to minimize past mistakes, um, justifying, yeah, to minimize past mistakes through rationalization, turning confession into justification, irrational justification. Okay, justif justifying, minimizing. Okay, so um, okay, so the uh, yeah, so that could be um, okay. Yeah, I'll say the exaltation is. Um, Admitting mistakes, rationally correcting, fixing them. And... Okay, and then finally, the design earth, which is manipulation, the ability to transform interaction with inferior elements into the energizing of progressive process, probably means progress, but process, with the additional benefit that in tapping the inferior elements, they remain weak. So it's keeping keeping weak things weak, but being able to use them for a better purpose. The instinctive recognition of the patterns leads to the possible manipulation of others. So I'm just going to call it as at its best, um, being able to use poor quality ingredients to make something. I don't know how to put that. Instinctive recognition of the patterns leads to possible manipulation of others. Uh, being able to use others to move your ends. And then at its detriment, the tendency in this form of manipulation to become abusive and degenerate to their level. The possibility that the instinctive recognition of the patterns could lead to the abuse of others. Abuse and using. Um, okay, so, um, yeah. Okay, so let's now, um, I'm just going to read it and then I'll take a little break. Thank you so much for watching so far. I hope you've been getting a lot out of it and enjoying it and just kind of following along in the notes if you ever, you know, I mean, again, you can pause it, start it up again, watch different parts, skip ahead. We're just going through, you know, we're going through all of it. And so after this, we're going to talk briefly about the, the three, five profile. Then we're going to go on to the four transformations and then the not self. And uh, so the potential wisdom Having a healthy attitude that knows when to withdraw. You can learn how to cultivate this attitude. Cultivate the healthy attitude that knows when to retreat. Have a vigilant receptivity to approach. Always be receptive, right? Continually remind people you're open to approach. Have the courage to admit the mistakes of your past. You know, obviously not trying to guilt trip you with your undefined ego to try to have the courage. I mean, in some sense, you, you don't have uh, the gate of courage, which is the gate 51. So as you'll see when we get to the not self part of it, you know, self love means accepting that you don't have to have the courage. So it sounds funny then to say to have the courage to admit the mistakes of the past. But I guess what I'm trying to say is, you know, you'll be able to, to, to determine what the difference is here. If you're beating yourself up with your undefined ego saying, I lack the courage to admit the mistakes, I'm such a bad person. Stop doing that. Self-love means you don't have to beat yourself up about anything. Don't hold yourself to some insane standard of being so loyal and being so trustworthy and being so 
good and so right and so you know don't hold yourself to that standard it's okay let yourself be yourself okay so at your best at your exalted you're a spirited dedicated confessional manipulative person and you know that last one you know manipulative could be um like another way of thinking about it um, <coughs> um logistical you know effective effective at using people you know they they give you um, a bunch of employees and the employees aren't very good and the employees are getting drunk on the job and they're degenerates right and you can be at your best spirited dedicated you can be confessional meaning that you're really like letting people know that you're you're confiding in them about mistakes you've made in the past and then you can be logistical and effective even if it is manipulating them quote unquote getting them to do things and that at the best you know so but the thing is this will require you being private to preserve your own spirit and having success through that privacy even victory through retreat while also maintaining community sensitivity and an accepting atmosphere admitting mistakes rationally correcting fixing them and moving on with a clean slate and then being able to use others to meet your own ends without dropping to their level but here's the thing as the not self you're not going to get that as the not self you're going to be private to a fault you're going to block people abruptly and go no contact you're going to burn, burn bridges with them you're going to give them silent treatment and you're going to take no responsibility for the other person as not self I won't say silent. I'll take off silent treatment because that's more of a gate 22 thing. You don't have gate 22. But I mean, you're at least going to burn the bridge with them, I should say. And take no responsibility for the other person. You can be moody, careless, and oversensitive as the not self. You'll see the not self will pull you into that moodiness, carelessness, and oversensitivity, which minimizes past mistakes through countless justifications and rationalizations leading ultimately to abuse and degeneracy, dropping to the level of the people you are using. So say you have those employees, the ones I mentioned that are not doing very good, and then you know, to, to, be, to abuse them, you know, that, that's the negative side uh, of this you know, you know, manipulation and so on. And so really, um, you never have to experience that side of it. I mean, you don't. You can really, but you probably have because this is a not self world out there. You've probably experienced that side. So part of this knowledge is just to be able to have a vocabulary for and to understand dynamics that have happened for you before in your life and to be able to go, you know, that's just the dynamic it was. And now that I'm really following my design, I'm waiting for invitations, I'm following recognition. Although I have heard by the way that the uh, defined G center, um, that the self-protective projector is not necessarily it's the only projector that doesn't have to be wait to be invited i don't know about that i still think they have to be invited but they sure show up uninvited a lot the self-projected projector has showed up uninvited it's interesting how that works i've noticed them show up places just kind of they, they just trust their their own g center to take them there for better and worse you know it's not always a good thing sometimes it blows up in their face but in any case, uh, we're going to continue. We're going to look at your three, five profile bonding strategy. We're going to go on to the four transformations and then we're going to go on to the not self analysis. I'm going to make another cup of coffee and I am going to um, have some more water and take a little break. And I will be back soon. So I'm just going to pause uh, Zoom and I will be back shortly. Thanks again for watching. Or, you know, I'm going to, I'll just um, start it as a second video, as a part two. That, that way it'll be nicer to kind of have it have it split in two. So we're starting part two with profile, and then we'll do the four transformations in the not self analysis. Okay, thanks for watching part one.